There's been a huge surge. Dr. Amir is here. We'd love to get his thoughts on this. Huge surge in the number of medical places being offered and dentist places being offered. And we're now hearing, Amir, that the government are offering £10,000 incentives to various medical students that have qualified or newly qualified... Got their good grades. Yeah, to not take their first choice of medical school and to take a medical school that perhaps isn't quite as popular or isn't oversubscribed. I mean, a £10,000 bribe, essentially, to go to a different university to study medicine. Yeah, morning. Yeah, th th this is on the cover of lots of newspapers. Uh, medical students being offered money or asked to defer places because there are caps on medical schools. I teach at, at Leeds Medical School. I I'm a senior lecturer there. And I understand why there are caps. The, the, the issue is, is clinical placements, placements at hospitals, placements at GP surgeries. We can only have so many students come in per year group. Uh, to see patients and be overseen safely. So we can't just increase the number of, of placements at medical school. Uh, it is tough. It's really tough. I've been listening to your conversation there. Uh, and, they, they're, you know, normally medical schools hand out uh, placements on the premise that lots of students won't get the grade, mm. so they over yeah. over offer. Uh, but this year, that hasn't happened. Uh, there are some newer medical schools that are increasing their capacity to allow for this, to allow for movements. Uh, but it will be difficult for students who have been asked to change universities because mm. lots of things will be in place already for them to accommodate that that they've done to to kind of prepare to go to that university but it is tough but medical schools and dental schools do have caps for very specific I mean, would you have taken ten thousand pounds if the government has said to you look you i don't know where you studied medicine initially but if they'd said to you here's ten thousand pounds either defer or perhaps go to a a different medical school would that have been tempting to you no, I, I studied at the University of Liverpool uh, and no, I don't think I would have because uh, I, I was from a working class family and £10,000 would have been a lot of money. But I, I you know, a, a year off for me just wasn't feasible. I, I didn't have that option. It would have had to go to, I would have had to go to university to start earning as soon as I could, really. And lots of medical students will be in that same position. And it's not like uh, medicine's a short course either, is it? <laughs> well, no, mm. but also, uh, uh, d uh, d you know, I mean, it, it feels a little bit like an irony, isn't it, that one of the reasons why there has been such a popularity and interest in, in studying medicine and dentistry is because the wonderful work we've seen medical professionals do during the pandemic. And, of course, we're always talking about, aren't we, how much we need more doctors, we need yeah. more nurses, we need more GPs. So it seems a strange option to offer £10,000 to put off someone training for a year. Why would it not be better to, to use that money to fund the places to allow more doctors to get trained? It seems an odd way of solving, actually, a bonus. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds straightforward, but it isn't that straightforward, yeah. really. You know, it goes back to this idea of limited placements in hospitals. We can't have a surge of students come in to speak to patients the same at GP surgeries. We've also, also got a limited number of medical teachers as well. Not every doctor or clinician teaches. And to get that high quality of teaching that is needed for, for medical education, be it at medical students or other allied mm. healthcare professionals, you need good teachers and they're not all there and they take time to train as well and I, and again that comes from someone I, I train GPs I train medical students uh, I train doctors to become teachers as well so it takes time to get to that level of, of teaching what quality. What you're saying is not everybody is a Dr Amir Khan with a perfect <laughs> no. garden uh, no. lecturing <laughs> offering comfort to the masses we need more of you that's what they should be offering Can places for. Can I mean, I just how, ask many, you... how many hours do you have in the day because for you to be a lecturer a gp a full-time horticulturalist yes. a naturalist <laughs> uh, a dancer you watched him dance rather a dapper there. dresser this morning i noticed as well <laughs> we've got a bit of a sartorial Anything elegance <laughs> going on with your sports jacket <laughs> it's, it's all about time management as soon as I finish talking to you, I'm hot footing it to the surgery to start seeing it patients. Is. It's we're, all about time management. We're only a tiny bit, we're only a tiny speck of dust in your day, aren't we? <laughs> but just before you go, part. <laughs> a mere blip in the calendar. Um, looking at some of these, the COVID figures, they seem to be going up again. And also questions being asked about how we are testing. I know we talk about testing, don't we, all the time. So Professor Paul Hunter... Uh, I think from Norwich University, has said that we need to look more clearly at how we are analysing um, the people that get tested. We need to think about how we look at people in hospital. Uh, we should be looking at people who come in 
because of COVID infections, not just who happen to have COVID Change and come the way in we're for something else. Figures, isn't it? Look at the clarification. And also give up on the idea, really, of getting community immunity, herd immunity, because we're not going to be able to stop that and just really focus on decreasing the effect of symptoms of COVID. What do you make of that as a message? Well, I think the idea of herd immunity, I know we talked about this a lot earlier on in the pandemic, but we're moving away from it. And the reason behind that is for herd immunity to be achieved, we need high levels of vaccines that not only prevent symptoms, but we need that to prevent transmission of the virus as well. The more infectious the disease is, the more people we need vaccinated uh, to, to achieve herd immunity. For example, with measles, very infectious. We need really high numbers to be vaccinated with polio, serious condition, less infectious, lower levels to achieve uh, herd immunity. The vaccines are extremely effective at preventing serious um, illness, but the evidence around transmission, they do reduce transmission, but they don't prevent it. And that will he not help with this idea of herd immunity. Obviously, there's an uneven rollout of the vaccine across the globe, vaccine hesitancy, delayed rollout in younger people. All of that will mean that herd immunity probably isn't achievable. And the aim is about getting enough people vaccinated uh, to prevent serious illness. Of course, the idea of emerging variants from different parts of the world will probably mean tweaking of, of the vaccines to, to allow for boosters later on. Uh, but, but the idea of herd immunity now, we're moving away from it. And, and I think, yes, with, in terms of the way we report it, we are going to see endemic levels of, of coronavirus in the population. So we might now need to move to a different way of reporting cases uh, and people going into hospital with coronavirus. They actually admitted with symptoms of coronavirus. That's their main reason for admission. And that might be the direction of travel now. OK, a couple of just quick things as well, and I'm, I'm sure none of these are particularly quick. You mentioned boosters there. Sajid Javid mm. saying the booster might come around as early as September. Although there's concerns over that, isn't there? Because if you have the booster for a moment, that does reduce your immunity until the antibodies build up again. Uh, is, do you think we're going to see it that soon? Is that too early to be sort of planning boosters? Well, I would be in favour of boosters for new variants, no, not necessarily boosters for, for the variants that are already here, that we know that the, the double jabs protect you against. It's much better to try and vaccinate the rest of the world where there's lower, um, uh, lower levels of vaccinations uh, going on. Uh, and actually, the evidence behind boosters is, is lacking really right now. It may, it may come later. America and the rest of Europe are holding off of boosters uh, and they're encouraging other parts of the world to get the vaccine rather than a third dose for those who have been doubly vaccinated. Uh, Sajid Javid is pressing on with the September mm. booster vaccine, particularly for the vulnerable group. It's very complicated with boosters. So the idea of antibodies, there's lots of different types. Yes, it might boost your neutralising antibodies, but actually the two jabs you've already had will probably produce enough memory cells to give you longer lasting protection anyway. So boosters are a bit of a hot topic at the moment. There's a lot of debate going on. Okay. And the other one is, is pregnant mm. yeah. women. 98% of expectant mothers admitted to hospital with mm. COVID mm. have not had the vaccine. And we've seen a couple of very tragic cases, haven't we, over the last week or so uh, of mothers who have lost their lives. The baby has had to be you know, um, brought and given a chance of life, uh, um, even though they were probably too soon to be born. So, th so the, the reality of what COVID does, if you're pregnant, is there. What is the hesitancy, do you think? There's a lot of misinformation out there with regards to the vaccine and pregnancy. You know, 130,000 women, pregnant women across the US have had the COVID vaccine, the mRNA vaccines, uh, and there's not been any safety concerns. I think it's difficult when you're pregnant to know what the right thing to do. All you want to do is the right thing for your baby. And COVID itself, yes, pregnant women are aren't not at increased risk of getting COVID, but if they do get it, particularly in later stages of pregnancy, there are increased risk of complications, stillbirth, that kind of thing, which are very, very tragic. So on balance, and the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the chief midwife agree with this, on balance, it is safer to get get the vaccine than to get COVID. Right, we're going to have to leave it there. Yeah. Of course, it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's a dilemma for lots of people, isn't it? Because for a long time, they weren't sure whether it was OK. If we know it's safe, that's hugely mm -hmm. important. I, mean, I think there's something it. about being pregnant that makes people very cautious. Course, but we've now seen anything. so much evidence of 
of the worst of the, that can happen. That... I mean, he's got to go and do one of his 75 jobs, so we need to let him <laughs> get going. There's a bit of deadheading yeah, you need say. to do behind you before you yeah. go, I've spotted. You've got to feed the hedgehogs, the squirrels, the birds, the butterflies, deadhead. Make sure Mama can't yeah. OK, then get to the surgery. Yes. So. <laughs> There's a lot to do. There's a lot to do. <laughs>